All right, guys, welcome back to Urgent Word. We are wrapping up this look at Paul's letter to the Galatian churches. We've talked about the context, what was going on that provoked Paul writing this to whom and, and what kind of churches they were and, and what the presence of these, these Judaizers who were, were teaching that the Gentiles must become cultural Jews in order to be saved, that that was the next step in their discipleship process. We've diagnosed their viewpoint and we've seen that Paul is writing very vehemently against this idea that he, 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 he even calls it another gospel or that they're leaving the good news about Jesus behind by accepting this. We've explored a little bit of the applications for what this looks like in today's Western cultural context. And we've done our best to understand what is the good news. And we're going to wrap up with this beautiful ending of the letter, this this move away from certain lifestyles into another lifestyle. These Gentile believers are being invited to put down the things in their culture that are not of God and to pick up and to be redeemed in their culture for the things that are of God, this new creation. So let's dive in. So let's read from chapter 5, verse 13, all the way through the end of chapter 6. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. 
to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. What a rich and wonderful way to close this letter, an invitation to the life in the spirit. And I do think it's worth pausing to note that, you know, we are reminded that this is an ancient piece of mail, that this text has been preserved. You see, uh, I write in my own hand, see how large the letters are. So maybe Paul's handwriting looked a little bit something like this. He has some distinct handwriting. I just think that's fun. But obviously, Paul has poured his heart into this urgent word to the Galatians. And he's inviting them into a life by the Spirit. And he's inviting them into the law of Christ. This is how he summarizes this whole debate with the circumcision group. That neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. This is the rule. A new creation. This is the life we're being invited into. This is the the fruit of what it means to be crucified with Christ and be born again into his resurrected life, that the new creation, what God is doing, uh, this is is the, the kingdom come. This is the reality of heaven come down into earth, pervading and invading our lives and coming out as transformed people. This is only something that God can do. Creation is not something that we can do on our own. It reminds me of David's prayer in Psalm 51. As he says in the Hebrew, Lev tahor bara li Elohim. Bara is the Hebrew verb for creation. It's something that only God can do. And the same is true of this word in the Greek, this thesis, this concept, this creation, this is something that only God can do. If the good news meant that you could do something to make yourself right with Christ and to bring about the kingdom of God, that it was on you, that it was on your behavior, that it was on on something that you did, something like circumcision, something like full obedience even to the precepts and and the covenant of God, that we are incapable of living this out on our own. And that's the good news, that it takes an act of God for my heart to change is a mercy indeed. So what Paul is inviting people into is not to earn their way. They they don't make themselves more loving or or kind or patient or gentle or all of these fruit of the spirit, more self-control, all of these things that he wants them to grow in this love of neighbor, all of these things. we, we, We have responsibility here, but it's out of response. It's out of partnership with God's grace that he is recreating our hearts just as David invited God to do. Bara li, create in me, lev tahor, a clean, a pure heart. This is nothing short of new creation. I was watching a a video today about an international gathering of indigenous Christians, and one of the speakers said that, that Satan creates nothing. He only corrupts, and we need to remember this, that the heart we have that craves things that aren't good, that wants to justify ourselves, that wants to do any law rule thing that that we want to do just to make ourselves right with God, but fails over and over again. And, 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 you know, as Paul talks about this war between the spirit and the flesh, the flesh being our compromised human nature, that, that we don't always want what is good. How can we change that heart? Well, this is what the good news is that we have put with Christ. We have been crucified. That heart is, is, is put to death. And a new heart is growing in, in our lives. A new heart is growing among us. A new heart that previews uh, this idea of inaugurated eschatology. If you want to go back on this theme, we live in a, a kingdom already and not yet. That the realities of the new creation are unfolding before us that what God plans to do, what we're aiming at, this full hope of of Jesus' return, the new heavens and new earth, that this new creation has started right here. This is what counts. So Christ is changing 
your heart and he's changing your life. Our life then in response to the good news, in response to joining Jesus in this, this crucifixion and this resurrection, we live in response to, to grace. And it is out of this deep love and grace and confidence and what Jesus has done that we are truly changed. So what counts is the new creation. I know this is a big concept, the idea of new creation, the idea of, of who we were made to be becoming a reality through the participation we have in Christ. It's a big concept. And I want you to go to God with it. As you read this description of of this life in the spirit that Paul talks about, this tangible evidence of the new creation showing itself in the, the cultivation of your character and the changing of your heart, both as individuals and as a community of believers, I want to close with this reflection. How is the new creation in your life? So as we've reacquainted ourselves with what the good news isn't and what the good news is, our prayer is this, that the new creation, this intent of God and restoring his his family of believers, his family made to represent him and to, to, to embody his character, that this reality, this recovery of human vocation is, is happening among us that we would grow more aware of it, that we would grow in our love and our joy and our peace and our patience and our kindness and our goodness and our gentleness and our self-control. And that we wouldn't try to earn anything, but that we would fully participate and aim our hearts, incline our hearts to where God intends. So as we join, as we participate in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, may the life by the Spirit be true among us. We pray that every tribe and tongue and nation would come to the table and experience this new creation as they become more of who they are in Christ. It's not a monoculture. It's a multicultural reality that Christ is aiming for in this new creation. May we whet our appetite for that kind of beauty And as we crave it, as we hope for it, as we seek it in the here and now, we know it is on the horizon in the new heavens and new earth.